Web Service Interactions Using JMS As of version 5.0, we now support sending and receiving messages using JMS Transport. What we support with this version is two different message formats. Messages can arrive as serialized SOAP envelopes or as a plain XML document. The JMS message types we support are text and bytes, as are appropriate for either a serialized SOAP envelope or an XML document. The message exchange patterns that we support would be one-way request, sending and receiving, request response with a durable reply destination, and by durable reply we mean there is a permanent queue accessible as opposed to using request response with a temporary reply destination. In order to enable JMS transport, the first thing you need to accomplish is how do you connect with an external JMS provider. That's handled through instances of a JMS manager that's included with the Active Vpool Enterprise project, product. The um, manager is configured with a set of settings that establishes connections with a particular JMS server. And there can be any number of configurations specified to support connections to multiple JMS servers or providers. One of these configurations can be set as the default. The config and that's the one that's used unless another configuration is specified in policy. So if you're communicating with only one JMS server to send and receive, then one configuration specified as default should be sufficient and there wouldn't be any need to specify at the invoke level which one to use. So a messaging manager is a grouping of communication settings that are used to talk to a particular instance. And when you configure one, the first thing you want to decide is the type of provider. And all of these providers, we will use a Jindy lookup to access the connection factories and the destinations that we use to send and receive. What you get by selecting a provider is that for a number of tested configurations we can set up a number of defaults that are appropriate to that particular provider for you. Kind of, you know, we know what the um, factory properties need to be, we know what the URL needs to look at and look like and we'll provide a sample for it. So um, for our tested configurations, we would have a drop down, but that doesn't mandate that or you're not restricted to those particular configurations. Any, theoretically, any provider that supports JMS 1.1 and is accessible via Jindy lookup can be used. But in that case, you'd want to choose other and set up the properties as are appropriate for that particular provider. The settings for connectivity are as you would expect. We have a connection factory name, and that's the Jindy name of the JMS connection factory. Initial context properties are the name value pairs that are used to establish connection to your server. The values are provider specific, so consult the documentation with what it is you're trying to connect to to get examples and um, more information on what's required. In the example here, we show <coughs> JMS MQ and the um, settings for the URL packages, the context factory, etc., would be from the JBoss client API that is supplied by that particular vendor. Now you have to remember to include the libraries that contain these classes on, on the class path for the Active People server so that we'll be able to find it. Because again, this is an external resource that we're connecting to and it isn't shipped by active endpoints. In order to 
receive messages over JMS transfer at a minimum, there needs to be at least one listener bound to a JMS destination that will be able to dispatch messages into the Beeple engine. You can configure the listeners on either a queue or a topic, and you can create listener configurations by setting the properties for what what's the destination name of what you are going to be listening on, the um, Jindy location, the name of the listener class. It will default to the um, base listener class that ships with the um, with the enterprise product. The selector, that's a JMS message selector string. If you choose to filter messages as they arrive or only select certain messages to be dispatched into the engine. And you can also provide a default service name. And what the default service name is used for is when a message arrives, it needs to determine what service, what's the target service that is um, deployed within the engine that you're trying to hit. And there are a number of mechanisms that we use to determine that. We can use WS addressing headers. We can use JMS header message properties on the JMS message. But if none of those options are available, you can specify a default service, which means any message that arrives on said destination is going to be dispatched to a particular service. So if you're going to be accepting, say, some plain XML messages and it's not going to be within a SOAP envelope and the sender won't be setting any of the properties that could be used to determine what the target service is, then it'll fall back and say, okay, well, we'll just dispatch it to the default service. And then that default service could then, once you have the message within the, um, within the process that's exposed through that service, it can then make any additional routing decisions or simply process the message. The, um, when sending a message over JMS, there's a JMS invoke handler. So users of the product are familiar with the default address-based access client invoker that sends and receives SOAP over HTTP. Similarly, you would choose JMS, and rather than sending SOAP over HTTP, it would send either SOAP or plain XML over JMS transport. And But like any other endpoint, we would use an endpoint reference to describe the target address, policies for security, or other options that may be required to format and send the message correctly. That, those are all applicable. So it, the real difference between using JMS versus any other transport is the fact that the address, rather than specifying an HTTP URL, needs to indicate the queue, the Jindy name of the destination that the message is going to be targeted to. So for example, in the address, if this was going to be an HTTP request, you'd see HTTP colon slash slash host name colon port with any context path information slash service name would be a typical construct for that address. When sending to JMS, the URL is different. It would be the Jindy name of the destination to send to. And optionally, you know, again, depending on who you're talking to, whether you need to indicate a target service. And at a minimum, that would be all that's necessary, would be a default messaging manager configuration and choose the JMS invoke handler and specify the queue name as the endpoint address as opposed to for SOAP HTTP, the HTTP service address, for a process address, all that's necessary would be the service name of the MyRoll endpoint that you are trying to invoke through an internal process invoke. Again, that doesn't need any additional information besides the service name because that's all internal. But again, it's like the address is appropriate to the transport, in this case, JMS.
And in that case, what you will get without specifying any other options through policy is by default we'll send a text message containing a serialized SOAP envelope to the default JMS manager. There are other options that can be used to override the defaults. So you can set a policy for JMS message type. There's two options there, text, which is the default, or you can specify you want to send a bytes message, which means that the contents of the request message are serialized to a JMS bytes message as a byte array. You can also choose the message format. By default, we will construct a SOAP envelope but you can also indicate that you want to just send an XML document. That's also available, and in that case you would want to set the on the JMS delivery options policy the JMS message format to be XML. There's some runtime values that you can override. You can set the JMS priority, which is an integer value, the manager ID, if you have multiple configurations and you want to send it to a specific one, in the example I'll show later, we receive, send and receive to both JBoss MQ as well as IBM MQ series. In order to use a non-default provider, you have to tell it which configuration to use. And so you would set the manager ID in policy. You can also override the JMS correlation ID. By default, we will synchronize the JMS correlation ID with the WSA message ID that's used in WS addressing. Now, that would be applicable whether you serialize it as a WSA header in a SOAP envelope or not. There's, you know, every message will have an, an ID and it'll use that it's a GUID that's associated with that message. So. You don't have to worry about generating a GUID if that would suffice, but if you need to set it to a specific value, for example, if you received a message over from a counterparty and the correlation ID is within the body of the message and you need to set that before invoking a callback, you can override that through by mapping that value into the property in the policy. And we have an example of doing that, which We'll walk through. The other thing you can set would be the time in milliseconds as the JMS message expiration. Now again, we'll set this on the JMS message, but a lot of the specific behaviors are very much provider dependent in terms of what they actually do with setting priorities and expirations, etc. Now the in invoke can support both one-way requests, which would be a natural for JMS, which is inherently asynchronous, so you would expect to have a one-way request and a one-way response for any replies that come back correlated. That would be a um, natural message pattern, but we also support two-way operations where there's request and response, and in that case, what we'll do is, you know, similar to any of the transports we use, we'll use the native back channel that's provided by the transport in question. In this case, in JMS, we'll use a temporary queue to receive the reply, which is a standard JMS mechanism for supporting two-way exchanges. And it's useful when the response doesn't need to be durable and because this particular destination only exists for the duration of this invoke. Your messages are not persisted. It's not something where the server can go down, it comes back up, you can recover the message because it is by definition a temporary queue. So if that's not appropriate, what you need to do is you need to tell it how, where to send the replies and and likewise where the invoke handler should be listening for the reply to this to this request response invocation. So the standard way of doing that, since we're using an endpoint reference and WS addressing, is you'd want to indicate in a WSA reply to element on your partner endpoint for the invoke that will both 
if you're going to be serializing to WSA, that'll indicate that you have a reply to to tell the receiver where to put the message, and also you're telling the invoke handler where to listen for the response, and that would be accessible via Jindy lookup on the address. And here we have an example. This would be a queue. Hold on, let me back up. A queue that we would be that we would like to use for the reply. Other items that can be specified on an endpoint when you invoke is you may need to set JMS message properties. And you can specify additional string properties by using a specific reference parameter on the endpoint reference. So we're going to send this to on the Q slash com active e JMS people queue to the JMS one way service. But we also want and the um, you want a reply to go to this other queue with this on this other service. And we also want to set a JMS message header property, and that would be a param name value pair. The um, JMS message properties from an inbound receiver also accessible from within the process using the ABX get my role property function. Get my role property function is used to get any transport items from either SOAP envelopes or in this case JMS message properties that would be associated with a receive on that partner role, the my role from that partner link. 